Good morning, church. Well, the uh, sermon title is entitled, entitled The Global Revolution Begins. And I would say, uh, listening to Land's communion, it has begun in her heart. And uh, this is a lesson to be learned that, uh, you know, when we don't give up everything in our heart, it's like a dog that sees something it wants, a cat or whatever it is, and it goes running after it, and inside it's like, I'm, gonna, I'm free, I can get this thing. Only to find out that it has a choke on its neck, and it goes, ah! And whatever it is that you haven't given up for God, it's like a ball and chain around your neck. But you see, with land, that ball and chain has gone. Yes. That has gone, and you can see it, can't you? Yes. There's no grumbling, there's peace, and there's vision. Come on. And a remembering of her original dreams as a child. Come on. Too often we have killed our dreams of a child, but God is trying to reawaken them. Yeah. You thought you'd be some hero, and that is what God calls us to be. You yeah, so the global revolution. There's a lot of information in the sermon because it's, it's one of those lessons that's a little bit of a lecture. So I have actually put the scriptures in it, but we're going to fly through the beginning of it. So this is the book of Luke that we're going through. And uh, Luke actually wrote these uh, books while he was in prison. So sometimes, you know, life doesn't go well, you're stuck in bed or something like that. There's often a reason for it. Paul wrote his letters from prison. Because God says, I need, you to not st I need you to stop running around and write something for future generations. We know Luke is a doctor. He gives us the best medical account of the crucifixion. He was a Gentile, which means one of us. Amen. It means he wasn't a Jew, so he can relate to us. He actually met Paul on Paul's journey um, during his second missionary journey. And we know that because as uh, Luke writes the book of Acts, he goes, Paul did this, Paul did this, and then he goes, us, we. Showing that actually, he was, this is where I join the story, guys. This is where we join the story. And um, one of the great qualities about Luke is, Luke is an incredibly loyal person. So actually when we read uh, in Timothy, Paul writes in his last letter, in 2 Timothy 4.11, at the beginning of it he goes, everybody in the continent of Asia has deserted me. So Paul spent his life building these churches in Turkey, and everybody fell away and left him. They didn't want to associate with him. Except it says in 2 Timothy 4.11, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him to you, because he is helpful to me for my ministry. You know, loyalty is the opposite of selfishness. You see, it doesn't say be loyal when your friend is doing well. It doesn't say be loyal when he can give you something. Loyalty is one of those things when the chips are down. Will your friend be there? That's Ian and Margot to us. When the chips were down in Brisbane, and Ian and I were gonna to have to go back there, we would sit on this step in this park and I would put my arm around Ian and go, thank you for being my friend, my only friend, because the church had fallen apart. And I never forget that. Loyalty is a quality. It's a godly quality, because he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. But it also needs to be part of who we are. You know, all the missionaries, though, I am so fiercely loyal to the missionaries. Why? It was they that came. It was they that put their heart on the line. Yeah. What about the person that met you? Maybe they've even fallen away. Are you loyal? Have you pulled your heart back? Yeah. Who have you pulled your heart back from today? You know, Luke is a gospel to the Gentiles. So Mark was the first gospel to be written. It's the shortest gospel. And um, it just sort of goes, here is Jesus. Let's preach good news. Then you've got Matthew. Matthew was written to the Jews. Hence why it's actually the first gospel in the, in the gospels, because the Bible says that we will go first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Then Luke is written, and he takes a lot of eyewitness accounts, which we uh, talked about last week. And then John is the final one, and the last one to be written, and it actually adds some things that the other gospels have missed. So, you know, part of it was the Judean ministry, etc., like that. But the themes of Luke include women, okay? What was that? Includes women. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I normally have to do that to the men, not the women. Okay. Um, joy. Amen. Okay. Money and healing. Or uh, 
basically not to love money. Okay. It also talks about this concept of sozo. The word is sozo, which is to heal, to restore, to save, or to deliver. So in Luke 19.10, if you are unclear about what the purpose of a Christian is, let me just lay it out to you here. Luke 19.10 says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. And that is the word sozo. So what is Jesus' mission statement? I have come to save the world. You know, I studied the Bible with someone this week, one of uh, Pete's friend, And he said, uh, he started talking. And uh, I didn't know him, but Pete said, can you help me with this guy? I've sort of studied the Bible with him. And so, you know, it, Jesus sometimes, when they meet religious people, is very confrontational. So, as he started talking, I said, you're very selfish. And you can tell Pete smiled, because we've been friends a long time. <laughs> He's like, okay, here we go. <laughs> and um, he was talking all about, you know, I'm a good person, and I do love people, and this. And he started saying some things, and I said, no, actually, you're very, very selfish. Now, I can say that to anyone. You know why? We're all selfish, right? There's not one of us that isn't selfish. But Jesus would say extreme things to see how the person reacted. I didn't say you're selfish and I'm not. I said you're very selfish. Because I wanted to see where he was going. Because if you tell me I'm selfish, I am selfish. We're all selfish, right? But the issue with religious people is they won't admit that. He goes, no, I'm not. He said, even the old church I went to told me I was. I went, well, okay, I'm onto a thing here. You know, people, I don't know you very well. And he talked about, well, I'm a Christian. I do give to people and I do this. And I just said, look, okay. Let me ask you this. What was the purpose of Jesus? Jesus went around and talked to people the whole time about God, right? That's what he did. I said, you say you've claimed to be a Christian for the last eight years. Where are all the people that you have invited, sat down with, studied the Bible with, and converted? Because if you've been a Christian eight years, there'd be a ministry behind you. You're a talented guy. Where is it? He said, I don't have one. I said, then you can't call yourself a Christian. So let me ask you, in the last two weeks, how many people have you gone up to, complete strangers, and just spoken to about Jesus? Because I don't do that. I said, then don't call yourself a Christian. You can say, I like God, I know God, I'm reading about Jesus, but you can't tell me you're a Christian. I said, because if I walked in and said, I'm a racing car driver, and you went, have you ever driven a car? No. <laughs> you ever been on a racing track? No. I said, well, then you can't call yourself a racing car driver. You can call yourself a fan. Right? You can call yourself somebody that wants to be. And it nailed things down really, really quickly. I said, you know what? It's really, really great. Go out today with Pete and just start evangelizing. It will change your life. It will expose you. He went, yeah, I'm going to do that. And he went off and uh, started evangelizing with Pete. You know, sometimes you just got to lay it out really, really simply. A Christian is somebody whose purpose in life is to go out and save other people. It's as simple as that. But that is the opposite of selfishness, isn't it? It's the opposite of religion. Uh, so the global revolution begins, and maybe as I just challenged you all there, maybe that's just started in your heart. Amen. <laughs> so, Luke chapter 4, divided into three sections. First of all, Luke 4, 1 to 13, the mortal Messiah, the fact that Jesus is mortal, and that's really important, and we'll get to that. For Luke 4, 14 to 30, the radical revolutionary. Jesus was the most radical person that ever lived. His teaching was so radical. Love your enemy. No one has dared to say that ever. You know why? Because no one's dared to do it. And then Luke 4.31, the lonely liberator. When you want to change the world, it's a lonely thing. So point number one, the mortal Messiah. So Luke 4 verse 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. Sometimes the Bible sort of understates something, you know what I mean? He didn't eat for 40 days and he was hungry. If this was a single brother, he'd be like, what do you mean I'm hungry? I'm starving! Ah! But it's the Lord we're talking about. Amen. So he was full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we don't like where the Holy Spirit leads us, right? It takes us where we need to go, not where we want to go. <laughs> um, also, in the other scriptures, it talks about uh, he, he was tempted. Now, we know Jesus didn't sin. 
So this was of God. Sometimes we're put through hard situations, you go, I just don't like this. God puts us through situations to purify us. And then he says, you know, he was hungry, he fasted for 40 days. Why 40 days? Well, first of all, it shows his humanity. He was mortal. Imagine if Jesus was just purely God. Wouldn't be relatable, would he? He wouldn't be able to connect with us. We couldn't read in the scriptures his struggles. What I love about reading about Jesus, he was just like me and you, but he overcame. That's why I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like him. Potentially weak, but really strong. You know, why 40 days? Well, Moses fasted for 40 days in Exodus 34, representing the law. Elijah fasted for 40 days in 1 Kings 19, representing the prophets. So the Bible often says there was the law, the prophets, and then the gospel. So this was the accumulation of all of those. He was also described as the second Adam. So Jesus was in the desert while Adam was in the Garden of Eden. Jesus was weak while Adam was well fed and could eat anything he liked. You see, there is never an excuse for blaming our circumstances to sin. Jesus did the opposite of Adam. He was in the desert, had it really rough, and yet still did not sin. Adam was in the Garden of Eden. There were no other men to annoy him. There were no other men to throw rocks at him. And yet he had a great wife in Eve, or companion, and yet he still messed up. Our sin is our sin. Amen, church? Yeah. But he was mortal. He understands. And then he goes really into what really happened. Luke 4, verse 3. So the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up a high place and showed him in an instance all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourselves down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands and so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. I think that's one of the verses I hate most in the Bible. Satan doesn't go away. He waits till an opportune time. When does he tempt you most? When you are weak, when you miss quiet times, when you alienate yourself from other brothers and sisters. He's just waiting. He's just waiting. You know, Matthew and Luke have different sort of views on this, but the temptation is written twice. Why? In the book of Matthew, everything is established by two witnesses, because it's written to the Jews. So you have two demon-possessed men, etc. Because to the Jews in the Old Testament, there need to be two testimonies. Well, here we have a testimony in Matthew and a testimony in Luke. So that we can confirm that, you know what, even from a gentle's point of view and a Jewish point of view, this has actually happened. Throughout the book um, of uh, Luke, though, it makes a literary way of writing. So it's not necessarily logical. So basically, the, one of the themes of the book of Luke is everything happens in the temple. And that's why at the end here, it all finishes in the temple. But what about the three temptations? What is the first temptation? It says, if you are the Son of God. Think about this. Did Jesus struggle with believing he was God in the flesh? Yeah. Wouldn't you? See, you can know something, right? But that doesn't mean that you're not tempted with it. Like, do you know that God will look after you? Yeah. Do you feel that all the time? No, see, that's temptation, isn't it? See, Jesus had a mind. He had a heart. It was tempted. We can know things for absolute sure when we're logical. But what about when you're emotional? What about when you haven't eaten for a week, a day, a lunchtime? <laughs> Honestly, you know what it's like? Sometimes you just miss a meal and you go, I'm just all emotional. <laughs> It's true, though. Sometimes it can be like that. Now we're seeing the mortality, the human part 
of Jesus. That he was tempted. Satan said this is an opportune time. He is in touch with the fact that he is human because he has not eaten for 40 days. He had his doubts. He absolutely had his doubts. Because he was part human and part God. Life is not about logic. Life should be about logic, right? When it talks about the helmet of salvation in the book of Ephesians, why is it the helmet of salvation? The thing that keeps you saved is your logic. It's not your emotions, it's your emotions that make you struggle, but also motivate you. But here he's saying, you know, if you're the Son of God. He's like, maybe he's doubting now. I mean, he hasn't eaten for 40 days. He's understanding what it means to be a man. Why hasn't God fed him for 40 days? Why hasn't he sent him ravens to give him food like he did with Elijah? What's going on? He was tempted. And yet, what did he come back with? The Word of God. It's always the Word of God. Then he says, tell this stone to become bread. He goes, you know what, Jesus, take control of your life. Come on, you've got miraculous power. See that stone over there? Turn it to bread. You ever seen those cartoons where, you know, they're hungry? I don't know, some like Tom and Jerry hungry. And then they look at another person that's meant to be their friend. And all of a sudden it turns into like a chicken. Do you know what I mean? They're like, oh, it's a chicken. Okay. Yeah, that sort of thing's going, see that, br that stone? It could be bread. <laughs> He's like, use your power to change your situation. Sometimes God just wants us not to do anything. In actual fact, the temptation to take control of our life can lead us into sin. I think about Sarah. God said to Abraham and Sarah, you'll have a child. But she wasn't patient. So she made Abraham sleep with Hagar. So I'm like, God, you're not answering my prayers. Yes, I am. And the answer is no. But I want a boyfriend now. No, you're not ready. You need to change some more. But I want to pass my exams this year. Maybe you need to stay behind a year because God has a plan for you not to move back to your country for another year and it has nothing to do with you. But we want everything now. We want every answer now. Sometimes the answer is in your time. You know, the world teaches us to prioritize ourselves first. But we must always prioritize God and his kingdom and let him take care of us. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Now, this is the one I think in the first world we struggle with the most. You can have it all. Sometimes we really want to compromise this, this sort of gospel of health, wealth and prosperity. If you put God first, you will have a great career. You will have a house. You will have that. Let us remind ourselves, in the early church, if you were a Christian, they took away your possessions. That was the cost of becoming a Christian. Why? Well, basically, Rome at its time had been expanding. And then the barbarian horde started to attack and started to win. So they all wanted somebody to blame, right? You know how that goes, life goes badly and you start getting upset at your husband or wife or kids or flatmates. No, none of you do that, okay. All right, and they wanted to blame, so they went, why has this happened? I know why, we've allowed these Christians in the empire and everybody's worshiping then and we need to get everybody to worship the old Roman gods. And then if we do that, then we will start winning the battles. So let's start killing and, and persecuting these Christians and then the Roman Empire will expand again. And that's literally what they did. Our struggle to want career and everything the world promises, that's all from Satan. You know, God should be enough. And that's why Jesus responded, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. If I asked you, do you serve your boss? Well, it depends, doesn't it? If you're missing quiet times and church services, then you're worshipping your boss. You're serving him. All right? Are you serving your parents? Well, if your parents' opinion of you is more important than God's, then, yeah, you're serving your parents' dreams for your life. Who are we really? What about ourselves? So, well, I want... This is one of the biggest struggles. I want this. How about what God wants? And then the third temptation. This is where Satan twists scripture. And understand this, Satan knows scripture. We go, well, how can so many churches be wrong? They know the Bible. And what do you think they were gonna use? 
Do you think Satan was going to come to Jesus and go, hey, I'll tell you what, I've got a brand new book called the Quran and it's going to convince you. He doesn't bring the Quran to Jesus. He doesn't bring some Baha religion to Jesus. He goes, I'm going to twist the scriptures. Satan has always used false Christianity, false godliness to try and pull people away. And yet, to be victorious, we can only do it if we rely and we obey on God. Point number two, the radical revolutionary. Who wants to be a revolutionary today? Yeah, man, right. Who wants to die tomorrow? Right, that's my point, okay. You see, you don't know what a revolutionary is. And that's the problem, isn't it? Right there. There's an old story about, um, it's in one of these old preaching books, I remember it, it goes, a Russian, during the communism era, goes into a church. And he gets his clash in the cup and goes, Tsh! he goes, anybody in here who's not a Christian leave because I'm going to shoot all the Christians. And nearly all the church leave. And there's a minister and four people left. He puts his clash in the cup down and says, right, now start your service because these are the real Christians. Ah. I wonder, would we be willing to give up everything? Because that's the true test, isn't it? Luke 4, verse 14, says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. You know, so now we get this whole thing, the revolution begins. There is a part in John 2, 3, and 4 of the Judean ministry, but that's not the big focus of Luke. Why? Here he's trying to think about global revolution. So most people that read the Bible are non-Jews. Okay, so by this time when Luke is being written, it's been written to most of the Gentiles. And yet, Matthew had been written and Mark had been written, that's what the Jews had focused on. But Luke's really going, I want to talk about world evangelism. Um, it says he was teaching in the synagogues. Jesus went and picked fights. Jesus went to places where religious people were. Let me ask you, maybe you come from an atheist background, you've been converted. It can be quite intimidating studying the Bible with religious people, right? Because you feel like they know their Bibles more than I do. I remember when I was a young Christian, I went home and my family's incredibly religious. Mum's a minister, was a minister in a church, and aunties are Catholic, and cousins are Jews, and my sister went off to a uh, religious uh, college, etc. And I hadn't had any of that experience, I'd not read my Bible. And I remember going home for my first ever Christmas, and I knew what the way I was living and how I was doing was right. And I knew that they were wrong because of their lifestyle. And I remember going home and really trying to convince them with the scriptures and being wrapped around the Bible because they knew the Bible better than I did. I got so frustrated. And it was at that point it changed my life. And that's the way failure should help you. I went, I need to become an expert at the Bible. This just reading the Bible for myself every day, just to make myself feel encouraged, that has got to stop. I was talking to the young prophets yesterday, I said, you know, I asked them, well, see these young men we're training up, I go, what do you think the difference is between you and me? Why do you believe that I have so much conviction and, and in areas you don't? Do you think I was just born this way? And I'm glad they went, no, <laughs> I wasn't. I was a guy at a party that would just try and sort of, you know, not talk to everybody. I said, the real issue is, is I really love my Bible. I'm confident because I know what it says. That's how the revolution starts in your heart. To really not just read the Bible, but take it, learn it, memorize scriptures, do studies on yourself. And every, every lesson I do, especially for midweek, are studies I've done on myself. When I've been sinful and I'm going, I need to repent. Let's use the scriptures to make me repent. And then I'm just sharing them. But that's how we need to be. Jesus picked a fight with the Bible and went to religious people and went, right, now we need to correct you. So Luke 14, 16, he said, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read. So he goes home. He goes into the local synagogue and he starts to go for it. Well, how do you think it all went down? Let's read on. <laughs> Luke 17. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. So sometimes there are just opportunities, right, that come up. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everybody in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's sons, they asked. You know, when we study the Bible with people, there's a sort of progression. Okay? With some people, if they're rich young ruler, you do get into it straight away. But actually, Jesus here is quoting Isaiah 61 and 2. The next verse actually goes on to say, to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. It's a judgmental verse. But he goes, I'm just home. I'm going to start with seeking God. I'm going to ease these guys into it. And I'm just going to start talking about the year of the Lord's favour. You know, but we are meant to preach freedom. Before we pull the cost on somebody, before we sit down and really challenge people, they've got to know what's in it for them. That's true, right? Why would you become a Christian? Why do I want to become a Christian? When we share our faith, we've got to pre preach freedom. I am free of the fear of divorce. Because Kerry, who I'm very much in love with, is a Christian. I never think about us getting divorced never happens I'm free from that I'm free of the door being knocked and a policeman coming and arresting me whereas before I was a Christian there were many things a policeman could have come to the door and arrested me for so I was a guy the door would go knock 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 and I'd hide behind it that'd be me and maybe some of us were the same too policemen weren't the exact people our best friends I'm free of smoking I think about it how much would I have spent on smoking if I'd never repented of it before I became a Christian I think once I did add it up and it's almost like half a house. It's that much now. What are you free from? Worry, anxiety, pornography? You know, we need to share that with people that literally, people don't understand, becoming a Christian can free you from so much. I'm free of what my parents think about me. That's a big thing. That's a huge thing for most people. Most people are ruled by their parents' opinions. That's a horrible thing. You never get to live your life. What have you been set free from? Then Luke uh, 4, 23. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your whole town what we have heard you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, No property has, is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there will be many widows in Israel in, e in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zephyrath, the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet none of them was cleansed, only Naaman and Syria. So what does he do here? Now he turns up the heat. What's he saying? You Jews, throughout your history, God has wanted to send you prophets. And yet you will not listen. So he has sent them to the Gentiles. And he gives them these two examples of Elijah and Elisha's time. You know, and these were sort of uh, parallels. You know, if a Jew said, you know, you had leprosy or you had a widow, these were curses. And God said, I can heal you of every curse. But if you're not willing to listen, I will go and heal Gentiles. Well, how do you think that made them feel? Okay, well, let's read on in Luke 4, 28. It says all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town. Not in a car, just drove him out of town. Okay. And took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. They went nuts. Absolutely nuts at this guy. Which sort of reveals that they weren't very godly people, doesn't it? That's what anger does. When you lose your top, you're going, I want to take control of this, and this is wrong. Where spiritual people go, God, deal with this situation. They wanted to kill him. Why? Because they were being challenged. How do you feel in being challenged? The truth of it is, we don't, none of us really like being challenged. But if you're spiritual, you understand that it's part of the Christian life. Why? Because we're not spiritual. 
We need to be challenged down on earth so that when judgment day comes, we'll be found to not be lacking. But here they were, they were being told the truth and yet they rejected it. How do you feel when people bring things up to you? Are you that person that's really, really humble? And I love what it says here. It says that Jesus walked through the crowd. I've often wondered what that would be like. So the whole crowd, I mean, imagine this crowd, I don't know, um, let's pick somebody, really, um, I don't know, where's Brandon? Brandon's a good-hearted thing. Um, Great-hearted guy, but imagine we all grabbed uh, Brandon to throw him out off a cliff. Oh, you see, that's why I picked Brandon, that's why I picked Brandon. But imagine that. How could Brandon avoid this? I think Jesus had so much masculine conviction, he changed the crowd. He was like, you need to stop this right now. What you are doing is unrighteous. Put me down and let me walk away. How else could he have done it? It is amazing how your personal conviction can change a room. It really, really can. I've shared this story before, but it's a good one. Sometimes just righteousness wells up inside you. I remember we were driving down to a staff meeting in London. And we came out, it was a great morning, we all had breakfast, all prayed, and it was great. Came around the corner, and there was this like 17-year-old beating up on this 13-year-old. Just... I was like, that's just wrong. And I went up to him and went, put him down! Now! Went. And then the little guy said, run! <laughs> so what are you doing? It is amazing when you have conviction how you can change a situation. Yeah. That was Jesus. I've had many conversations with different people. And they go, just, you're just too hard. I said, am I as hard as Jesus? Mm-hmm. Jesus talked about hell all the time. He was always rebuking people. For righteousness sake. Are you a man, brothers? Or are you a wallflower? I'm not talking about manly going down the gym, etc. I don't think Jesus ever went down the gym. Not that anything wrong with going down the gym. But too many of us believe that we should be men from the outside in rather than the inside out. When people have a conversation with you, do they remember it forever? I think when people had a conversation with Jesus, they remembered it forever. That's why, I mean, these guys were writing these things down 20 years later, 30 years later. It stuck with them. Some of us need the more steel and velvet, the velvet side. Some of us need the more steel side. But Jesus was somebody not to be messed with at all. You know, carrying on in Luke 4, 38. says, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. And they asked Jesus to help her, so he bent over and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. So Jesus was a man. He was also incredibly loving. He looked at Simon's mother and said, Simon, I I know we'll get into things, but your your, your mum needs helping here. There was also a real gentleness to Jesus in the moment. Another way we see that, you know, Jesus was really attentive to women's needs. I remember my sisters growing up. I have two older sisters, and I always remember this, because as a young guy, I was always trying to get into fights and stuff like this. And my sister told me, said, it takes more of a man to walk away from a fight than it does to get in, into one. That always stuck with me. Now, from a selfish point of view, I was going, oh, so women like me to walk away from fights more than get into them, so that helps me get women. That's where I was coming from at the time. But I did understand from her a concept that what men teach men is not necessarily right. So we have to allow Jesus to teach us what is right. There is a time to be manly, and there is a time to sozo change this woman. Luke 4.40 says, At sunset the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, laying his hands on each of them, and he healed them. Here again we not only see the personal touch with Peter's mum, and by the way, also he has a mother-in-law um, showing that if P- Peter was meant to be the first pope, he was married. So obviously he can't have been that. Um, but also it talks about how he, as a result, went and touched each of these people individually. Same old people. 
Or do you go and find other people to build a relationship, other people to get involved in? You know, there are some incredible women in our church um, that really do such an incredible job. I think about people like Millie. You know, Millie does so much for the church. She's running this marathon, which, let me tell you, takes a lot of time out, an enormous amount of time out. She also, when it comes to young prophets, she's the one with India baking all of the food. She's out there. She does all the administration. That's visas behind the work. That's flights behind the work. That's doing the budget behind the work. She also, with her group for Women's Day, has got 13 people for three of them all paid and come up for Women's Day. You know, we need to appreciate the women in our church. We need to value them. But we also need to become great women as well. I know I've sort of lost my notes and gone on to the end here. So if you haven't noticed that, I have. Amen. <laughs> Luke 4 verse 41. It says, Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when he came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he also said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. You know, I've often wondered why Jesus wanted the demon to be quiet. It's not until I've started this time I get it. The Jews believed that whatever demon said was a lie. So he was actually saying, you need to keep quiet. I know it's the truth, but nobody will believe you and they'll use that against me. But here we also see the, the real turns and twists in Jesus' life. He preaches to some people, they get really angry and they throw, want to throw him off a cliff. Now they can't get enough of him. Why? Because he's healing them. You know, are you coming to God for what you can get out of God? Or are you coming to God for what you can give to God? And it says that he keeps on preaching in the synagogues and Judea. You know, one of the great things about the movement, the global movement, is that it is worldwide. One of the great things I love about the Sydney Church, and if you've been around, I think you appreciate it too, is how many different nations that we actually have in the church. At the moment we have 21 different nations for 60 people. That's pretty unique, I think, in nearly any church. And yet, that also means that we are training people up to go on foreign mission fields. So Manny is leaving at the end of the year to go and help our church in Nigeria. Amen. Why? He has a Nigerian passport. God didn't make him Chinese, so we're not sending him to China. Okay, pretty logical stuff, right? So if you have a Nigerian passport, guess where God will call you to? Nigeria. But Lan has a Chinese passport, so she's going to... China! That makes okay. Dom has a German passport, so he's going to Germany. We got a call about a month ago um, and, uh, from the London church going, hey, can we have Dom please to train for the ministry for Germany? So I set him down and said, Dom, it's time to go. He went, Amen. It's time to go. It's time to go. There was no, I can't believe they're sending me back to Germany. Ah! No beaches in Germany like here or whatever it is. He goes, I've got a German passport. And then, you know, I said, you need to tell Daniel first. I go, how'd it go? He goes, yeah, he's going to Germany. I know, it's okay. <laughs> the only question is, is when do I go? You know, okay, I'm German too. God calls people. I think Aaron, coming back from Hong Kong, he's going to come back in a couple of months uh, just to finish his degree. He's had a phenomenal time in Hong Kong, having a massive impact. His Cantonese now is completely and utterly perfect. He'll come back for six months and they'll go and be in the ministry full-time in Hong Kong forever. Amen. Um, we've got Fang uh, Mao coming. She's uh, moving here in September. Again, she's from Guangzhou and she's training to be in the ministry for China. Uh, I love the way we change uh, different situations in the church so Chidra is going to London for six months uh, six weeks sorry uh, or five weeks why why not she got a holiday she got some money given a special given a contribution let's go that's great in the worldwide kingdom that's what we should there's nothing wrong with that you can't do that in other local churches you know we all need to have this heart to go anywhere at any time for the world mission are you excited about raising money for the New Zealand mission team? 
It can be a lot of fun. It's been really encouraged. I'm very proud of, of, of uh, Kerry helping us. Kerry's family basically helped us do our special this year. You know, we've all got little goals, okay? $4,000, $2,000. It's encouraging. Kerry and I have been able to give $10,000 already. No, you don't give just what you're meant to give. Because I know the Bible says whatever you give, if you give generously, he will reward you back generously. So I thought, okay, well this year we've been able to give our special early, so let me do something for the poor. So we set up this new charity, Adopt a Miracle. And I uh, ran the marathon yesterday, that's why I'm a bit wobbly today, amen. <laughs> um, and uh, basically because my knees are so short, I can't do it in three weeks. Um, but it also helps me guide the guys around. But it's amazing who will give you money. I went through every uh, e uh, email I've ever sent to people. You know how you can just put an A and it gives you every single A, B, etc. like this. I sent the, uh, the GoFund link out to absolutely everybody. And yet last night I got another $500 uh, from somebody, the guy I met in Cambodia for breakfast, just met him once. He went, you know what, we give money every year. And I've decided now because I've written, uh, read your article, I'm going to give to you not only this year, but every single year. Wow. Ted, Ted gave us $200 for the course. Obey gave us $1,000 for the cause. You know, there are some great-hearted people out there that really want to help people. Yeah. It's just our boldness that we need to work on. Because there are always people that want to help. You know, and then Jesus was mortal. So Luke 8, 46. It says, someone touch me, and I know the power has gone out of me. This whole passage, you know, Jesus starts all this revolution. But he also relates to the fact that, you know what, it's hard to be a revolutionary. You know, I said, who wants to be a revolutionary, right? Who wants to die tomorrow? That's the reality of it. That's the reality of it. Talks about here how power came out of it. You cannot be a revolutionary unless you are well fed. Churchill in the war said, hunger and tiredness make cowards out of every man. We need to get up and have long Bible studies so we can fight Satan and temptation. We need to have long prayer times. More evangelism you do, the more you need to read and pray. And actual fact, this is one of the problems with the religious world, is the reason that they don't pray much is because they don't evangelize much. They don't give much. <laughs> you know what it's like. You go out there and evangelize, and you come back physically and emotionally beaten up. So you get up the next morning and say, Lord, help me to evangelize. That's what we're like. One is given to help us focus on the other one. You know, in conclusion, the mortal Messiah, Jesus was mortal. He related to our struggles, but he showed us how to overcome. You know, the radical revolutionary. Do you want to really be a revolutionary? You have one life. Do you really want people to say on your deathbed, he was a great engineer, built a bridge that fell down 10 years later. Is that what you really want to say about your life? Or do you want people to say, you know what, he was a great prophet, prophetess, helped build a bridge from earth to heaven for all these 60 people in their lifetime. And lonely liberator, I know I missed that point, but that's where I was going with it. It can be lonely, but if you've got a close relationship with God, it's never, ever lonely. Amen. <laughs>